yeah, cities all over the world have tried to somehow get a grip on the ever-increasing uh, automobile traffic in their areas uh, since decades. Some were more, some were less successful. Pedestrian zones were introduced, uh, some car-free areas were introduced in, in this or that city. But it turned out to be necessary to really create an alternative to the uh, car-dominated uh, urban transport system in our cities. And as one can easily imagine, this has to consist of walking, because the first step you do out of your bed in the morning to the breakfast table is walking, you're not driving. Uh, then uh, you can take the bicycle and uh, the public transport if you don't want or don't uh, are allowed to use a car because you're too young, too old or don't have a driving license. So and the majority of people actually is not car drivers. So what is the system available for them? And um, how do we call it when we say we, we walk, we cycle, we take public transport? There is not even one word and not one verb how to express when I'm not driving but using those modes of transport. So this led me to think about um, how to coin it. And in Germany we did this already in the late 1980s with a term Umweltverbund, which sounds in German nicer than the English translation would. And, uh, uh, this has become the uh, leading planning paradigm in German cities. Just by coining it, it was possible for urban planners, for urban uh, decision makers to actually name it. And then it's much easier to think it. And when you can think it, then you can much more easily do it. So when I was uh, Secretary General of uh, ICLE, the world's uh, largest network of, of local governments for sustainability, I was thinking what can we do we are working at the global level, so maybe it would be good to bring the global actors who are like-minded and who have um, a mandate in working in these areas to bring them together. So I was thinking of a global alliance of um, the leading manufacturers of uh, shoes, of bicycles, of small electric vehicles, to bring the industry associations on board. Then, of course, the cyclists themselves, the pedestrians, the users of public transport, and there are actually uh, regional and uh, global associations that represent them. So I approached them and walked to them. Um, and uh, then the big policy organizations. Um, I uh, got uh, United Nations Habitat, United Nations Environment Program on board and um, to form a global alliance. And when I visited the chairman of the world's uh, largest uh, manufacturer of bicycle parts, uh, Mr. Shimano, um, and uh, visited him um, in, in Japan in his office, he said, OK, we'll be part of it, but don't name it non-motorized transport. Yes, we are producing bicycles, but don't call it non. We want to do PR and we want to promote something that is pro and not against. So he sent me back to come with the right brand for it. And on my uh, plane ride back, plane flight back, I was actually uh, thinking the words through that could be used for this global alliance. And I came to, to the word eco-mobility. I proposed it to him. He said, that's the one we go with. And then we created the global alliance for eco-mobility. And this was actually then uh, launched at the United Nations Climate Conference in Bali, in Indonesia, with the presence of all these organizations. When the Global Alliance was supposed to work and to do a promotion of eco-mobility worldwide, we had meetings where actually the heads of the biggest bicycle manufacturers uh, were in the room. But then it was sad to see that they could not agree on a joint promotion of not even of bicycles that they produce. Nor did they really understand that they are part of an eco-mobility industry. So I felt that there is a little bit of a narrow focus with several of our partners. And um, as in the end, uh, this was the reason that no unity was, was um, able to be created uh, among all the stakeholders in this global alliance. The global alliance could not fulfill its uh, goals as envisaged. The one thing that the Global Alliance for Ecomobility produced is the brand Ecomobility, and this has been very successful because now we can name walking, cycling, and use of public transport with one word. We can say it's Ecomobility in contrast to the private automobile in urban transport. And um, further, further thinking how one can show to decision makers, particularly at the local level, urban decision makers and planners, how an Ecomobile city would look like. 
we have to create images because talking by words, this is my experience, uh, leads to each partner agree that we have agreed on something, but the image that each one has in their mind is probably a totally different one. So I wanted to create images uh, that speak, that say, what is eco-mobility? People who exercise eco-mobility in their own neighborhood. So I was thinking we should create cities that uh, where the citizens, the residents of a neighborhood move in an eco-mobile fashion, where there is no car in the area, and one can see how such a city would work and would function, and see it with, with images, and not by, by uh, creating um, animation, computer animation, not by compiling images from various cities and uh, the one who watches those, those uh, images has to put together an image of, of an entirely eco-mobile city, but to have it in one place. So this was the idea of the eco-mobility world festivals. The idea is one neighborhood goes car-free for a full month. This happened actually in Suwon in Korea in uh, 2013, where during the entire month of September, uh, 4,300 residents of the Hangong-dong neighborhood lived without a car. 1,500 cars that were registered in the area were actually removed, parked outside of the area. We brought in, and the city brought in, bicycles and small electric vehicles and um, small electric shuttle buses to satisfy all the mobility needs of people in the neighborhood. And then it started on the 1st of September. The area was practically car free. People were surprised. They got out of their homes and it was silent, no traffic noise. They could hear birds. They could hear each other's voices. So this actually led to also neighbors to talk because the street space was there. People pulled uh, the tables and chairs out of their homes into the streets to eat and drink in the evening together and they invited their neighbors to do so. Uh, uh, street musicians were, were giving street concerts, uh, street theater took place, dancing groups suddenly appeared in the streets and people were proud to ride the bicycle. Also people who have never ridden the bicycle in their lives, actually the city um, had organized a bicycle school so that uh, people could, could learn how to ride a bicycle and they did so, so proudly. And for me it's amazing, I visited this place uh, before of course, many times in the planning phase and then during the festival. It is amazing when you look at people's faces, how happy they were by just the stress relief, by no car in the streets, no motor noise in the streets, and so much space available for social um, interactions. That was amazing, and the project that I had more conceived as an urban transport-oriented project actually turned out to be a big uh, community building and social learning experience. And in the end, when uh, after the festival closed, the cars were supposed to come back. And on that next Monday, they came back. The big SUVs were again being put in, pl in front of the doors. Uh, many people were in tears. They wanted to keep this car-free neighborhood as it was uh, forever. So um, this led also to social conflicts, even inside of families. Those who were saying, yes, let's go towards a greener urban future. Let's try it, at least for this month. And others who were sort of very car addict could not imagine living ever without the SUV in front of the, 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 uh, in front of the doorstep, um, were very angry and opposing. In the end, the mayor achieved um, some sort of unity um, in, in the neighborhood that for this month they all do it. But it was not non-disputed, it was very much disputed. And I think the discussion has catalyzed a lot of a lot of um, thinking and reconsideration of the way how we live, particularly in Korea, which is very car addict and uh, car obsessed and uh, into consumerism. Uh, it has uh, strengthened, I think, those who think uh, green and who think more in terms of a sustainable way of living for the future. And uh, after the festival, the city convened the residents of the area for round tables to discuss how they want to see this neighborhood in the future. And people actually decided with majority they want um, a speed limit uh, of 20 kilometers per hour introduced in the whole area for forever. And they wanted to, to um, regulate parking in the way that in the main streets there would no parking allowed at all. So that short ways to just drive from home to the hairdresser or to the supermarket would no longer be possible. And the city introduced this, a speed limit and also parking restrictions. 
And this has led to a calming of the area. And it's amazing when you go there nowadays and compare it to before, how calm it is now in the streets. And um, not aggressive anymore. And you can see those who um, are dependent on a wheelchair or elderly people who walk with a walking aid, with a rollator, um, how easily they can now move in the area, which pre what previously wasn't possible. In terms of the methodology um, of um, a city scene project where residents play an urban future for a month, uh, I think this has worked well. For the residents, it was a unique uh, personal experience. For the city, it was an experiment. The planners could experiment with solutions and see how they work. And for the world and other cities, it was, I think, a good demonstration of what's possible. So I think the one learning is, one takeaway is uh, the method of city scene, which we call then festival in order to give it a very friendly appearance, um, worked well. Uh, secondly, uh, I think this project has proven, like many other uh, projects in cities worldwide over the last decades as well, that if there is strong city leadership and a vision to go towards calming of traffic, reducing the role of the automobile, making streets livable, that there is opposition. And when this is overcome, most of the people will be happy. And even the shop owners, who are mostly the ones who exercise fierce resistance against such a project, in the end, see more customers come when it's a pedestrian zone, more customers come by, by bicycle in front of the door than by car, then they are happy but silent. So I think strong city leadership, a green vision, uh, important and then just the power to, to follow through. I think also now in terms of thinking of uh, streets and movements and logistics, I think one of the big next challenges, but also not only ideas but also solutions, will be to put um, city logistics underground. At this moment there are trucks from various companies delivering parcels. And they are um, not only disturbing traffic flow, but they are uh, uh, noisy, uh, their engines uh, pollute. And you would think it's not necessary that each and every parcel is being brought by a big truck that stops for five minutes and, and so on. Many of these things can be actually delivered underground. So there are now underground systems available, like conveyor systems in a tunnel that bring from a station outside of the city where all the goods uh, that have to be delivered, all the merchandise for the, uh, for the shops and so on, can be put into and with automatic vehicles can be carried into the basements of the big uh, uh, office buildings and department stores. There they can be unloaded and go into the flow again. Fully automated systems. You have them already at um, the airports uh, for the luggage. There's underground systems that bring uh, and collect all the, the um, bags from, from passengers and distribute them to the right place where they are unloaded in order to get onto the airplane. So those systems can be introduced in cities and this would be an extraordinary uh, progress. It would even speed up deliveries uh, so that trucks are not in congestion. So I think this is something to tackle which is not yet really under discussion and airports are much more ahead than uh, cities are. I would like to uh, address another thing. We have increased traffic in our overhead airspace. I'm talking about drones. And drones, like every technical gadget, everybody is now looking into it. And what are the opportunities? Yes, we can put a camera there and we can survey traffic from a drone. Yes, we can do this and this and survey uh, gas pipes and so on. Um, but. Um, what is now being discussed is also parcel delivery by drones. So we'll face in, uh, probably 10 or 20 years where more and more of these vehicles will be just above our heads. And when you just look at how people behave, when a dark thing comes and goes over the head, so they will, um, will show that they are somehow afraid. That you don't like something to be directly over you and moving, and you don't know what it really does and where it comes from and where it goes to and what its uh, uh, sort of de uh, destination is, or whether you are being surveyed or just a parcel is going over your head. I don't think that cities should allow this to happen at all. 
There might be purposes where police need a drone to survey a certain traffic uh, junction. Um, exceptions can always be made. But I would think the next innovation in a city is to ban drones because they are not an innovation. They are, I think, a development that needs to be limited and, and banned right from the beginning. I mean, when you just look at it from a, maybe from space, you see people on this earth crowded in a few places, and they are called cities. And uh, over 50% of the people are already in urban areas, and it will be more, and there will be two billion or two and a half billion people more in the next 40 years on this globe. And they'll all be crowded in cities and in, in these big urban conglomerations. And um, as they are crowded there, they are really prone to disaster and disturbances and so on. Cities are extremely vulnerable. They are good places in many respects, but the more people are concentrated, infrastructure, capital, education, uh, everything is concentrated in cities, the more um, cities are at risk, but cities are also posing a risk uh, to, to, to the globe and to the planet. So to talk about urban risk is, I think, very important. And on the other side, to take it positively, cities need to be resilient to disaster, but also to the long-term impacts of climate change. And this has been discovered. Um, we introduced this uh, term of urban resilience in the year 2002 at the United Nations World Summit. And then it was a big success story because nowadays resilience is, is, is understood uh, by everybody that it needs to, to be uh, enhanced. And um, it requires, of course, that cities first do a vulnerability assessment. In which areas are they vulnerable? Is it uh, sea level rise? Is it flooding? Um, is it, is it uh, stormwater flooding uh, when there are heavy rainfalls? Or is it fires, explosions? Is it nuclear power plants that are nearby? So what are the main risk factors? Then of course the risk needs to be reduced to the extent possible. And then people uh, and cities need to be risk prepared. But resilience also means that the structures, and you can think of them as the physical structures, just the buildings, so that they don't collapse when an earthquake happens. And that uh, water pipes, not necessarily, and gas pipes break when an earthquake happens. So this means that the urban infrastructure needs to have certain characteristics. Flexibility is one of these characteristics. Redundance, to, to have backup systems. So if one system fails, there is another system to take on. Like in airplanes, the, uh, the electronic system, there is a second backup system that can come in when the first one fails. Uh, but cities don't have these backup systems necessarily. It means buffer capacity, for example, uh, when there is uh, heavy stormwater events. And uh, Chinese uh, government and Chinese cities are now uh, talking about sponge cities, cities that can, like a sponge, absorb the water, excess water, um, rather than to be flooded. And um, so there are certain characteristics of resilience, and I would think every city leadership and every uh, yeah, the city planning in every city should do a vulnerability assessment, risk assessment, risk reduction, and um, try to, to uh, rebuild or to strengthen or to uh, uh, yeah, uh, see that also new infrastructure and, and houses are being built in a resilient way. Then there is social resilience. How do people cope if something happens? So they are not desperate and let everything sort of fall and, and uh, fall into desperacy, but, um, but that there is, um, uh, there is the ability of people to cope. The Japanese are uh, uh, training people how to respond in terms of when an earthquake happens, where to go, where to run, what to do. This is also very important in case a disaster happens, that you have like the right instinct what to do, and not the wrong one. Um, so that is, is disaster preparedness. I think what um, the 100 Resilient Cities project that uh, is now being run in, across the world does, namely to promote that there are chief resilience officers in each city. That's the right approach, that there is vulnerability assessments. And we need not only uh, 100 resilient cities, but 1,000 or 10,000 resilient cities in the world.